Throughout history, the technology of war has continually changed, but the art of war, how a commander commands, has remained more or less the same. Nations have gone out of existence because of their failure to understand what war is all about, including its diplomatic, economic, and social elements. A great commander, one way or another, always seems to understand how all these forces are interrelated. In 1945, here in Berlin, the Soviet general, Georgi Zhukov, fought the final and most important battle of his life. Only with the raising of the Soviet flag at the heart of the Nazi regime would the Second World War in Europe finally be over. Zhukov is considered the greatest commander of the 20th century. His leadership of the Soviet Red Army from the defense of Moscow in 1941 to the assault on Berlin in 1945 changed the course of the war. Zhukov was, I feel, preeminently the commander of mass armies, of huge formations of war. He was prepared to take on a terrible targets such as the city of Berlin, a great urban sprawling area, which although was not being defended perhaps as well as might have been uh, had the Germans had more resources available this time, nevertheless involved a tremendous challenge to actually attack and take street by street such a great city as that. Of all the commanders in the Second World War, he is the one who most nearly, if not in fact wholly, uh, does merit the title of a great general. Georgi Zhukov was born in a small village near Moscow in 1896. Like the vast majority of the population, Zhukov's family was desperately poor. Aged only 10, the young Georgi was sent to work in Moscow. Conditions were harsh, and in 1914, when the First World War broke out against Germany, conscription into the army was welcome escape. They assigned me to a combat squadron, and I was delighted. In 1917, Russia's Tsarist monarchy was overturned by revolution. The war with Germany was abandoned. In the civil war that followed, Zhukov proved himself a competent leader and rose swiftly through the ranks of the newly formed Red Army. By 1923, he was commanding a cavalry regiment. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, the Soviet Union underwent a massive transformation from a backward peasant economy into an industrialized nation. Many of the reforms were brutally imposed by the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin. In an army that was poorly equipped and badly organized, Zhukov acquired a reputation for planning and discipline. In 1937, Stalin sought to ensure his absolute power against any potential threat from the military by launching a series of bloody purges. 40,000 officers were either imprisoned or executed. In this dangerous atmosphere, Zhukov's life was probably saved when in 1939, he was unexpectedly sent to fight a Japanese force that had invaded Mongolia, an ally of the Soviet Union. Well, the situation was very, very tense when uh, Zhukov was ordered out to Halhingol in the summer of 1939. Um, he uh, went out, quickly organized the defenses, and he uh, brilliantly took charge of uh, coordinated attacks against the Japanese using artillery, air, and tanks in coordinated actions. 
sort of a first ever for the Russians. He also replaced weak commanders, sometimes ruthlessly, until he found the commanders who could attack the Japanese. He used deception to great advantage against the Japanese. Uh, one small example is he had a book printed uh, called What the Soviet Soldier Needs to Know in Defense, and that was left scattered around the battlefield so the Japanese would pick that up and think they were, that the Russians were preparing to defend, when in fact he was planning a great uh, offensive. Zhukov's defeat of the Japanese was so devastating that they agreed to a non-aggression treaty. In the same year, the Soviet Union also signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany. But in this case, neither side was under any illusions. They would soon be at war. Zhukov was summoned to Moscow to help prepare for the coming conflict. His abilities so impressed Stalin that he was made chief of the general staff. Under immense pressure, he worked to mobilize a Soviet army that was desperately short of resources and officers. He told his family to prepare for war. Короткие записочки. У меня хранится дома несколько его вот таких записочек с фронта на листках, маленьких листочках из блокнота, написанных, как правило, каким-то цветным штабным карандашом, там, синим или красным. Вот. А потом, уже когда мы переехали в Москву, появилось больше возможностей говорить по телефону, и он нам часто звонил. Germany, having conquered most of Western Europe, attacked the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June, 1941. The Soviets suffered immense losses. A million men were captured and a million killed in this first offensive. The Germans felt assured of imminent victory. By the autumn of 1941, they had reached the outskirts of Moscow. Defiantly, Stalin held the annual October parade. Troops marched through Red Square straight to the front lines, only a few miles to the west. Zhukov carefully organized troops and established defenses around the city, which, combined with the effects of a severe winter, halted the German advance. Then he launched a counterattack inflicting the first major German land defeat of the war. I think Zhukov looked on the Battle of Moscow as his finest hour for the simple reason that they, the Soviets were really under a great deal of pressure. Uh, they had already evacuated the city in many cases. The government had been shifted over to Kubyshev. And uh, Moscow was two-thirds surrounded by the Germans. The Germans could see uh, the spires of Moscow from their positions, and Zhukov came through with a brilliant counter move and saved the situation. In spring 1942, the Germans launched a new offensive towards the oil fields in southern Russia. They made spectacular gains and entered the city of Stalingrad. Zhukov, now Stalin's deputy, was sent to save the situation. By amassing supplies and launching a carefully timed counter-offensive, he forced the Germans to surrender. At Kursk, in the largest tank battle in history, Zhukov inflicted a further defeat on his enemy. The Red Army had gained the initiative and now launched its own offensive. In March 1944, Supported by massive aid from the United States, they surged into Poland. By August, they had reached the Baltic Sea, and in October, they entered East Prussia. At the outset of the Soviet Union's struggle with Nazi Germany, they suffered from attrition at a remarkable rate. 
In the first nine months of the struggle, they are supposed to have lost all of three million casualties. That is a great many men. In the second great phase of the war, when they were about to reassume the offensive, or if you like, give the counterstroke to the German advance deep into their country, they use a combination of blows by these special tank armies, modelled in large measure upon the panzer corps of the Germans, associated with great wave attacks by infantry divisions in very large numbers, made up of all the uh, trained so uh, semi-trained soldiery drawn from the peoples of Russia right away to the east of the Urals and so forth, and they begin to grind down the Germans with this absolute determination to make their numbers pay. Having advanced over 300 miles in only 20 days, Zhukov reached the river Oder, inside Germany. The Soviets were now poised to make an assault on Berlin itself. The River Oder lies only 40 miles from Berlin, but they would be the most difficult miles Zhukov ever had to cross. The advance would require all his skills of command. Unlike military leaders of the past, such as Alexander or Napoleon, Zhukov had to answer to a political superior. He knew that as Stalin's subordinate, he was only a pawn in a complex political game. Caught between the demands of effective military leadership and the orders of a brutal dictator, he was forced to act both with great courage and caution. И опасность существовала всегда. И э, вот такой факт э, я могу привести, что всю жизнь, почти до самого, так сказать, вот, до 1957 -го года, до последних так сказать, событий, э, постоянно э, был приготовлен э, мамой чемоданчик, в котором были туалетные принадлежности и пара смен белья. На тот случай, что если за ним придут и будут его арестовывать, чтобы быстро собраться и уйти без... But Stalin, unlike Hitler, listened to his general's advice, and there was no officer whose opinion he valued more than Zhukov's. By 1945, the Soviet leader felt sure that his foremost general would secure him victory. He was already more concerned about the peace settlements that would follow. Military actions became dominated by political objectives. With Germany pushed back to her borders, the British, Americans and Soviets had met to negotiate the future division of Europe. Stalin played down his interest in Berlin, but was determined to take it first. Britain and America had, in fact, already decided to stop west of Berlin and let the Soviets attempt to take the city. I'm not sure that uh, the political leaders in America, the United States and Great Britain were willing to sacrifice our soldiers if we could let if we could let the Russians sacrifice their soldiers. Um, it may not be very nice, and it may not seem very uh, humane, but uh, if I have the opportunity to allow someone else's soldiers to die rather than my own, I would probably allow them to do that. And if that means they get the laurels and the uh, the uh, kudos, then let them have the kudos. I'll keep my soldiers alive. That, that's fine with me. But again, Zhukov is not operating, he's not an independent operator any more than Eisenhower or Montgomery or uh, MacArthur or any of those other folks who were fighting World War II. He again is a military commander who's being uh, told what to do by his political leadership. Zhukov realized that those were his marching orders from Stalin to have that flag on top of the Reichstag before the May 1 holiday of the Russian people. And so he followed his instructions. I think throughout the war, Stalin's eye was on the political goals, the long-term goals. And I think Zhukov understood that. 
and did his best to fulfill those uh, missions for, for Stalin. He also realized the importance of symbolism, of capturing capitals. The Soviet assault along a 200 mile front was divided into three main armies with a total of two and a half million men. Zhukov, to his frustration, was given command of only the Central Army. This too was a political decision. Stalin had no wish to find his own power challenged by a single victorious army general. Zhukov would have to take the city within the two weeks he'd been given and with only a third of the Soviet forces under his direct control. The Soviet approach to war is thoroughly professional and materialistic. To them, it is not a sporting contest against odds. To them, it is a business of amassing superior odds, of an immensely overwhelming order, and applying them at the right time and in the right place. That is what war is about. The sheer scale of the preparations that Zhukov ordered and then oversaw for that final great push on Berlin almost beg a belief again. Vast numbers of guns were assembled because he was determined to have a great maelstrom of fire to associate it with the final attacks on this sector. But every kind of logistical preparation you can imagine was carried through in a huge, in a heroic scale. This is not often, of course, the romantic side of wars, those of logistics and supply dumps and so forth, but they are, of course, the vital criteria if you're going to have the final success. And there's no doubt at all that Zhukov, in his preparations, in his briefing of his generals, making sure each knew his role, in his determination that there should be unrelenting pressure on all the various parts of the front, coming into uh, eastern parts of Germany with Berlin now in their sights, all this, I think, shows us a very competent, more than competent, uh, even a great general, preparing the way for the final blow of the war. Though many Germans realized that the war was almost over, hundreds of thousands still intended to fight to the last. The uh, fierce uh, resistance of the German troops, whether it was SS or uh, Wehrmacht or Hitler Youth or Volkssturm, everybody in that situation uh, knew that this was the, f the last battle. And the only hope for us was that somehow the Western forces came to Berlin before the Soviet troops would enter Berlin. While Berlin rapidly built defenses, Zhukov continued to prepare his army. I think that to exaggerate the capabilities of one's own forces is just as dangerous as to underestimate the strength of the enemies. This has been seen time and again in war and is ignored at our peril. We had just advanced 300 miles in a period of only 20 days, and after such an advance it was natural for the support units to be lagging behind and the troops to be in need of supplies. wants more men, more artillery, more guns, more planes. He never has enough, but Zhukov has never lost a battle. While huge quantities of supplies were brought to the front, Zhukov gathered his officers around a scale model of the area and explained that he had decided to focus on Route 1, the most direct road to Berlin. Across the Oder River, the road ran through the Salo Hills. These were his next and most critical objective. Everyone, including Hitler, knew the future of Germany would be decided on the Oder. General Heinrichi, commander of the German 9th Army and a specialist in defense, was sent to oppose the Soviets. He established a front line parallel with the river and a second line along the hills. At 8 p.m. on Sunday the 15th of April, he secretly withdrew his soldiers from the first to the second line. There they waited. 
Zhukov based his headquarters with one of his forward units. From there, he gave final instructions for the assault on the hills. In the early hours of the 16th of April, the attack began. The, the whole attack that hit us was so unbelievable and we just defended wherever we could. But uh, we knew that this was only limited and that was also the only purpose. It was limited defense as long as it was possible. I had seen nothing like it in my life. The Nazi troops were virtually swamped in a sea of fire and metal. A thick wall of dust and smoke hung in the air. I received a call from Stalin. Are you certain you'll take the Salo line? By the end of tomorrow, I replied. And the more troops the enemy hurls at us here, the quicker we'll take Berlin later. For it's easier to defeat them in an open field than in a city. It was the most terrifying artillery barrage of the war. But much of the shelling hit the abandoned front lines of defense. Then the river was crossed at over 60 different points and land assaults began. Zhukov demonstrated his greatness in the final drive for Berlin in a number of ways. Very heavy artillery preparation, air preparation, softening the battlefield. Although he was not, he would not know that Heinrichsy had pulled these people back from the, from their defended sites. Um, in many, many ways, he prepared that battlefield as best he could. He brought up plenty of supplies so that once they started the final drive to Berlin, there would be no no hesitation. Zhukov's troops approached the hills, but the Germans were expertly dug in, and the frontal assaults floundered. We had somehow underestimated the complexity of the terrain in the area of the Salo Heights, where the enemy had been able to establish a strong defensive position. And I must take the blame for this mistake. Zhukov was furious, but determined not to lose momentum, he ordered his reserve tank armies to attack at once. By the next day, April 17th, Zhukov had still not breached the German defenses. Stalin telephoned to tell him that Marshal Kunyev, in command of the Soviet army to the south, had made much better progress and was being allowed to turn towards Berlin. He knew that rivalry would make Zhukov even more determined to succeed. On the vast canvas of the, of the Eastern Front, the very nature of the, of the situation, this huge, brutal, massive campaign, I suppose meant that commanders uh, had to accept that um, in order to save Russia and to um, prevail over the, the, the Germans, that huge sacrifices were necessary. Uh, and I think that there's a certain, rather, rather obviously, a certain Russian characteristic to, to commanders like Zhukov, um, so that they are very tough, very ruthless people. Um, indeed, I think it's, it's, it's in the nature of, of any successful command, of any successful commander, that there must be some ruthlessness in him. If we come to a minefield, our infantry attack exactly as if it were not there. The losses from mines we consider only equal to those that we would have gotten from machine guns and artillery if the Germans had decided to defend the area with strong bodies of troops instead of minefields.
We have lots of evidence that he was very tough on his officers, on his subordinates. However, uh, we see no examples, none to my knowledge, that he was hard on his enlisted men. The soldiers adored him. He loved the soldiers. And uh, most of his uh, punishment was against the officers who were hesitant or cowardly or shirked their duty. The exception being that uh, he did take part in an order which said that anyone who retreated from, from the, in the face of the enemy would be shot, and he stuck by that. There's one story that did the rounds concerning Zhukov noticing a small group of what turned out to be wounded soldiers standing somewhat haplessly by the roadside. And as he approached them, he decided to slow down and find out what they were doing there. Well, they informed him that they were trying to get a lift back to a hospital or some aid post where they could receive treatment, and they'd been trying to flag down staff cars and all kinds of vehicles thundering past them for a considerable time, but nobody was taking the least notice of them. Zhukov thereupon told them to stay exactly where they were and await further developments. He then drove on past them several hundred yards and drew up his car again at the side of the road, and every car which now came swinging towards him, he had his staff to wave down and stop. And if he found that they had passed this group of soldiers on the road without offering them the least assistance, he demoted them on the spot and had them posted to some of the worst parts of the front thereupon. At Salo, Soviet tanks were repeatedly hit by German anti-tank fire. But finally, on April 18th, they overwhelmed the enemy positions. The town of Salo itself was then attacked and taken street by street. In three days of heavy fighting, 30,000 Soviet soldiers had perished. But the road to Berlin was open. All along the 200-mile front, German towns and villages were falling to Soviet forces. Zhukov, at the head of the direct assault on Berlin, organized for the final battle. Soviet reconnaissance planes made six aerial surveys of Berlin, its approaches and defenses. The aerial photographs were used with captured documents and prisoner interrogations to compile detailed assault maps that were supplied to all levels. The army engineers also constructed an exact model of the city and its suburbs, which were used to plan the final assault. On the 20th of April, Zhukov marked Hitler's birthday by bombarding Berlin with long-range artillery. Berliners, though used to air raids, were filled with dread. At the same time, he issued a declaration to his men to inspire them for one final effort. Now you face Berlin, Soviet soldiers. It must be taken and as swiftly as possible so that the enemy has no time to come to his senses. Let us bring all the power of our military equipment to bear on the enemy. Let us focus our will and intelligence on victory. Let us not disgrace ourselves. Какие общие качества привлекали отношение к человеку, я еще раз сказал. Поэтому меня заставило с ним поехать, Жуковым, потому что мы на него смотрели как на Бога, потому что это был, на него посмотришь, и вот как будто я в церкви был, и что-то от него набрался, понимаете. Это был настоящий, хороший человек. И я с ним готов поехать, как он сказал, на край земли, потому что из-за его... Человечество к человеку, понимаете? Вот это меня заставило. Из его отношения к людям, не только к нам, приближенным, а вообще он как относился к людям. Though the Germans were short of men and resources, the conquest of these 600 square miles of city would be a daunting task.
Ну а бои в Берлине, конечно, очень трудно было вести, поскольку город – это и есть город. И огромное количество зданий, и после того, когда так сказать, много было налетов авиации, и союзников, и нашей авиации, Берлин был разрушен. То есть это все затрудняло продвижению техники, вот. ну и другие так сказать, неудобства в связи с этими завалами. Ну и сам город, в общем-то, он представлял из себя крепость, каждый дом... Он представлял себе какой-то огневой рубеж, и взять его было очень трудно. Это же ведь не полевые сражения. Всегда битва в городах, она представляет определенные сложности. Das ist umso komplizierter, da auch die Rote Armee am Ende des Krieges nicht mehr nur aus hoch ausgebildeten Elitesoldaten bestand, sondern die großen Menschenopfer also schon einen ihr Tribut gefordert hatten und der, der jetzt die Auffüllung der Reserven die in, die Kampf, in den Kampf geworfen wurden, doch äh, auch schon weniger auch gut ausgebildet, ja, nicht immer sehr gut ausgebildet, die Qualität der Truppen sehr unterschiedlich war. Äh, Soldaten aus Mittelasien oder aus den tiefsten wie Sibirien haben zum ersten Mal dort in Israel dann eine derartig große Stadt gesehen, einen, einen Dschungel, einen Stadtdschungel, der schon an sich für die Verteidigung besonders gut geeignet ist, aber der für Menschen, die die nur kyrillische Buchstaben, wenn überhaupt, lesen konnten. Zhukov set up headquarters near the city and summoned his officers. A week of planning and trials culminated in him dividing Berlin into small sections, each allocated to a different unit. This remarkable coordination of the quarters of a million men would be the key to taking the city. Eigentlich äh, sehr im Gedächtnis geblieben ist, als äh, kurz vor der, bevor die Russen kamen und die vielen äh, ne, Flugzeugangriffe aufhörten. Es war ja dann ein paar Tage Ruhe, weil die sich ja nicht selber beschießen konnten, nicht? dass wir plötzlich ohne Fliegerangriffe waren, nicht? dass plötzlich hier in Berlin Ruhe war. Nicht? Und dann eben die ersten schwierigen Sachen, dass man eben die Angst hatte und dass man gerade als Frau auch eben Angst, große Angst hatte, äh, vergewaltigt zu werden. The Soviets entered the suburbs. Increasingly disorganized, the Germans fought on either in the hope of securing a glorious victory or holding off the Soviets until the possible arrival of the British or Americans. But the Red Army had already encircled Berlin and met the Allies at the River Elbe. With almost every house defended by snipers, the advance was difficult and bloody, but methodically and under Zhukov's careful control, the Soviets pushed on. Hitler, in the bunker of the chancery was virtually demented. Most of his staff were fleeing or had given up caring. Anarchy and chaos spread. As the net closed, the battle intensified. 14 and 15 year old Hitler youth were particularly effective in destroying hundreds of tanks with their shoulder held weapons. Hitler made a last public appearance to congratulate them. The key Soviet objective was not Hitler's chancellery, but the Reichstag, the parliament that Hitler had partially destroyed in 1933. The Soviets considered it the symbolic equivalent of their own Kremlin in Moscow. We all wanted to finish it off by the May the 1st holiday, to give our people something extra to celebrate. But the enemy in his agony continued to cling to every building, every cellar, floor and roof. But we inched forward, block by block, building by building. Well, it was the most dreadful thing. Uh, before six years of war, in many places, I had seen destruction and death and uh, terrible things happening. But uh, once a few days here, and once a few days there, and, and never concentrated as here. Here it was like having these six years put together in one and all the deaths, all the destruction, all the uh, 
the terrible things that happen in war in one concentrated place at one few days time and that of course you cannot forget but uh... on the 29th of april zhukov's troops reached the reichstag it was heavily defended and many died in the attempt to meet the deadline set by stalin one small group managed to break through in a reconstruction after the event soviet cameras recorded their success in raising the red flag only an hour before the May 1st target. Finally, I received the long-awaited call. The Reichstag had been taken. Our red flag now flew from the building. What a stream of thoughts raced through my mind at this joyous moment. The battle for Moscow, where our troops had stood firm in the face of death. Stalingrad, ruined but unconquered. Leningrad, holding out through its long blockade of hunger. And the thousands of devastated villages and towns the sacrifices of millions of Soviet people who had survived all these years, and now, finally, the goal for which we had all suffered so much. The complete crushing of Nazi Germany. The smashing of fascism. While Zhukov's men carried out the assault on the Reichstag, only meters away in the chancellery, Hitler had taken his own life. On May the 2nd, Berlin surrendered. Six days later, Zhukov presided over the signing of Germany's unconditional surrender. Of unconditional surrender. So, the state is ready to sign. During the final battles, the Soviets suffered more than 300,000 casualties. But Zhukov had led his troops to the heart of the enemy regime and crushed it. The war was over. Zhukov returned to Moscow and to his surprise was asked by Stalin to lead the victory parade. Uh, there's an interesting story there about Zhukov riding in the victory parade. Uh, Stalin insisted that uh, Zhukov ride that horse, the famous, famous white horse, in the victory parade. Zhukov said to him, no, you, you should really be doing this. Stalin said, no, no, you will do it. Later on, Stalin's son came to Zhukov. A few days later, he came to him and said, uh, you know about the, about the white horse and, and my father. My f father was going to be in the parade, and he was out practicing on the horse, and the horse threw him. So that's the reason you're riding the white horse. True story. Работники науки, техники и искусства, мои 
дорогие друзья, приветствую и поздравляю вас с великой победой над германским империализмом, соединенными усилиями великих держав Советского Союза, Соединенных Штатов Америки и Великобритании, фашистская Германия повержена в прах. Zhukov's position as the leading Soviet general made him, in Stalin's eyes, a potential political threat. Though he respected him too much to have him killed, he sent Zhukov to distant military postings of little significance and no power. Он знал, что он поступал правильно, и так, как нужно было для того, чтобы, в частности, эту войну выиграть. И то, что с ним так поступили после войны, конечно, было большой несправедливостью. И как любой человек, он не мог не переживать, не переживать и относиться к этому как-то Хотя старался спокойно. не подавать вида. Да, но... Внешне... Но мы-то знали, сколько да. ему это Посторонние стоит. люди могли бы даже просто не заметить, что он переживает. Но мы знали, потому что он ушел в себя, он много очень думал, и складочки на лбу у него почти не проходили. Сталин died in 1953. Under his successor Khrushchev, Zhukov was briefly rehabilitated, serving as Deputy Minister of Defense. But he was dismissed in 1957 and never recalled. I think he was a great commander for a number of reasons. He, uh, he realized the political imperatives. He never forgot those. He, uh, he was tenacious had strong will, willing to see a thing through, um, worked extremely hard to make sure that, that all aspects of an operation had been carried out. Personal visits to the front, uh, walking the lines, making reconnaissance, and keeping his commander, Stalin, fully informed at all times. Uh, getting guidance, fresh guidance. Um, every, every aspect of, of a great commander, I, you can see, I think, in Marshal Zhukov. Даже уже появилась такая поговорка, там, где Жуков, там и победа. Despite his abilities, Zhukov lived the last years of his life in relative obscurity. On his death in 1974, however, he was buried with full military honors in Red Square. The Second World War, more than any other event, scarred the history of the 20th century. Soviet losses alone numbered an estimated 27 million. German troops reached the outskirts of Moscow, but under the military leadership of Zhukov, the Soviet army saved their capital and, four years later, were raising the red flag in the heart of Berlin. Though, in the last years of his life, Cold War politics precluded a claim in the West and political jealousy kept him from the limelight at home. This victory alone marks Georgi Zhukov as one of the great commanders. <laughs> 